The proof of the first part goes as follows. So here we have a continuous function f. Yeah, here is the graph of a continuous function f and take some x in the open interval a, b. So x in between a and b. And take h so small that x plus h is also still contained in a, b. Yeah, and we consider the function on x and x plus h. Well, this function attains a minimum and a maximum since f is a continuous function on x, x plus h as well. So we may find a u of h, which is actually the minimum of the function values on the interval, closed interval x, x plus h. In the same fashion, we find there exists a v of h in the interval x, x plus h, such that f attains a maximum in v h on the closed interval x, x plus h. Yeah, so here we have v h. So what we know that on this interval x, x plus h, we know that f u h is smaller or equal than f t for any t taken from this interval and smaller or equal than f of v h for any t in this interval. So if we take the integral, the definite integral from h to uh, for, from x to x plus h, then on the left hand side we see a constant, so we get h times the length of the interval times the function value u h, and the integral x x plus h f t dt, and this one is smaller or equal than this constant f v of h times h. Yeah, so if we integrate a constant over a closed interval, then we get the length of this interval times this constant. So that's what we applied on the left hand side and on the right hand side. So what we do now is look at what we have as an integral x, x plus h, f, t, d, t. Well, basically this is the difference of g, x plus h minus g, x. Yeah, so g, x is the surface area below the graph of the function in between a and x, and g of x plus h is the surface area between a and x plus h. Yeah, so here we have gx and uh, gx plus h is the complete surface in between a and x plus h. So we have the difference here, the integral x to x plus h ft dt. Assume now that h is larger than zero and uh, we divide the inequality that we have here by h, the inequality. So on the left hand side we get f u h, in the middle we get the differential quotient g x plus h minus g x divided by h, and on the right hand side we get f v h. Yeah, so now the typical thing is that when we let h go to zero, so we take h smaller and smaller, that u h is still contained in the interval x and x plus h. So u h has as a limit x. So f u h has as a limit f x, since f is a continuous function. And uh, now we may show that if we take the limit for h to 0 of the differential quotient, then it's also smaller for the same reason than f x, since f v h converges to f x. So we see that the right limit and the differential quotient um, so the limit to h0 plus of gx plus h minus gx divided by h is equal to fx. Well, something similar happens if we look at h smaller than 0. Well, it's not depicted in the, in the figure above, but the, the, thing, the technique works the same. Then if we divide the inequalities by h, then we divide by something negative. So the inequality signs, they flip. So we get f u h is larger and equal than the differential quotient g of x plus h minus g x divided by h. And this is larger and equal than f v h. 
Again, if we let h go to zero, then fuh converges to fx and fvh converges to fx. So the term in the middle, the differential quotient, converges to fx as well, yeah, since it's enclosed by fx and, and fx. So the left limit of the differential quotient also exists and equals fx. So if we now combine these two limits, the right limit exists for h to 0 plus and the left limit h to 0 minus exists. So the limit for h to 0 exists and uh, if this one exists then we know that the derivative in x exists and also that it equals f of x. And this is exactly the first step that we need to needed to show for the main theorem of calculus. Well, the second part of the main theorem of calculus uh, allows for a more easy proof since we may use the technique for part one. So we, if f is a continuous function on a, b, then we may construct a primitive of the function by gx equals the integral of a to x of f t dt. Well, that's exactly what we've, what we've shown in the first part, that any continuous function on a closed interval allows for a primitive. Now, suppose we have an arbitrary primitive, f, capital F, for f on the open interval a, b. Then it's also an old result that since primitives on on these intervals, they differ by a constant, then we may express g of x as capital Fx plus c for some constant c. Okay, but now look again at the definition of gx. If we look at the definite integral from a to b of ft dt, then this gives rise to the value g of b. Right, so in the upper upper bound, we just substitute x equals b, so this equals g of b. But g of b is of course also equal to g b minus g a. Well, why is that? Well, the integral from a to a, well, it's a spike, yeah, and it has a surface of zero. So g of a equals zero, but g b minus g a, we know what g b is since we may now use the relation between capital F and g and uh, plug in f b capital F b plus c minus capital F a plus c so we obtain f b minus f a since the constants cancel. And this completes the proof of part two so if we have any Primitive. If we know some primitive of a function f, then we may just calculate the definite integral from a to b of ft dt by evaluating this primitive in the endpoints, so fb minus fa.